to introduce our next very esteemed guest, and I dare to say Zurich Instruments friend, Dr. George Nelson. I believe that ZI crossed its paths with George back in 2016 when he was working on his PhD thesis in the group of Professor Seth Hubbard at the Rochester Institute of Technology upstate New York. Since the group specializes in solar cells for satellite industry, studying defects that are caused by high energy particles bombarding the panels is of very high importance as it affects the performance. George took our MFIA and set up a DLTS station. George is also a MATLAB user, which actually makes him an ideal speaker before our API tour in the second part of this meeting. And he wrote his own software to set up and control the measurements. From what I read in the interview that he gave us, working on the code was a lot easier than he expected, thanks to the well-documented API. His code to this day is the most complete open source implementation of DLTS software available. And we are all infinitely grateful to George for his hard work and kind heart for sharing. Today, we will hear from him about some super high efficiency solar cells made of indium gallium arsenide and the characterization of the radiation induced states in the band gap. I would like to remind you all about the little Q&A box that you can use to ask a question to our expert during and after the talk. Don't wait up till the last minute. George, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you for the, the very generous introduction. Um, just a very small correction. Today, I'll be talking about uh, photo detectors made of in-gas rather than solar cells. Uh, my PhD was on solar cells, but my current postdoc was on um, <clears throat> detectors. But uh, really, we're just looking at the, the response of the material um, to space conditions. Uh, so the, the, the title of my talk is a characterization of radiation induced defects in the band gap of in gas by analyzing the PN junction capacitance. And I added a little, it's not in the, the um, schedule, but I added a little uh, subtitle here, plus a tutorial for the software that I wrote. And the software was used to collect all the data that you see and all the data in my recent papers, uh, which I welcome you to go read. Uh, and this is open source, uh, like was said, and uh, I'm happy to share it with, with the community. Uh, so the, 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 my talk will be, um, I, I very much enjoyed Ramon's talk this morning. I, I learned quite a few th new things. Uh, my talk will be maybe more geared towards beginners or intermediate users. And uh, I, I'm in, I'm, I feel motivated to introduce new people to the DLTS world, to, to bring new scientists into the field. And that's one of the reasons I, I share my code. Um, so I'm just gonna give a, a, a small summary of my work on in-gas photodiodes in the first half. And then in the second half, sliding, starting on slide 17 uh, is the tutorial on the software. Um, I will walk through the software with you. And if you're watching this later on YouTube and you're, you're in, interest is just the software, uh, you can skip to that uh, slide uh, just by looking at the bottom here. Um, so why are we interested in in-gas in space for detectors specifically? Well, because of the band gap, we can detect a sh short wavelength infrared um, to wavelengths a bit longer than, than silicon can. Uh, and this opens up uh, some, some applications for uh, agricultural imaging, climatology, uh, human activity. Um, here I'm showing a picture of the, uh, the NASA Landsat 8 satellite, which has a multispectral imager. Uh, it's got several bands, uh, several uh, linear arrays, and it has two in-gas arrays. Um, and uh, I thought this image was very nice. It, using the in-gas in this falsely colored image, the, the red here is uh, the remains of you know, the, I guess the smoldering remains of a forest fire in California. And there, there's also a perspective uses for in-gas for, for high-speed devices in space, uh, more active detectors like uh, high-speed optical link, which is laser communication. Um, so that's like shooting a laser to, to communicate between Earth and, and the satellite. So the, the, the reason uh, 
we are looking at radiation induced states. His, his space is, is hostile to the, the, the electronics. Uh, you have ions here, which, which cause uh, kinetic damage, uh, non-ionizing energy loss, base damage. Uh, there's solar winds, there's the Van Allen belts. Uh, protons and, and electrons are, are mostly what we're interested, um, are mostly what, what exist in these belts and cause the damage. Uh, so how does the damage happen? Well, it, it's in this figure, I, I've shown a simplified model of it. The, the electrons or protons come in, they, they push the, if they, they collide with, with a lattice site, they, they will push the atom out, causing a vacancy interstitial pair. Um, and these accumulate over time uh, and they, they may become recombination centers, which, which decreases the, uh, the sensitivity of the device. Uh, something else I would like to point out here is that uh, with, with annealing, there is the, the phenomenon of defect annealing with, with some heat applied to the lattice, we can actually diffuse the, the interstitial back into the vacancy, which, which will heal it. And I'll talk about that later. So I didn't do a, a DLTS introduction because I, I expected it to, uh, to be discussed already and, and Ramon did a, did a fine job. Um, so just skipping right to the, the spectra uh, results that, that are in the literature for in-gas. Um, it's been irradiated in the past with, elect with numerous species. Uh, missing was, was the lower energy protons. Um, so that's new in my work. But the, the big thing that I did was uh, this in situ DLTS technique. So all these previous studies, such as this one by Naval Research Lab, where they used electrons and they saw the dominant peak here called E2, these are ex situ studies. Uh, so, so they irradiate these at room temperature and they bring them back to the lab at room temperature. But these devices in space are not operated at room temperature typically. They're operated below room temperature. So this is not a perfect replication of um, of uh, space conditions. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention, to do the ground radiation testing, so if we don't wanna test these in space, it's expensive to actually test in space and you have to, it has to spend years in space. Uh, we take it to particle accelerators um, and we, we hit it with maybe 10 years of space radiation in 10 seconds. Uh, so for the, for the study, uh, we did in-house and commercial samples. I'm only gonna discuss the in-house here, uh, but the commercial samples uh, are, in, are in some of my upcoming papers. Um, we grew them at RIT using our MOCVD. I, I designed and fabricated the, the diode array. Um, here's a number of, of array chips on a, on a wafer and I cleave these out and I, I um, place them in this, I wire bond them into the cryoset. And here in the red line, I'm, I'm showing where we deplete. So this is where DLTS is testing. It's mostly in this N-type in gas base, as you can see here. Uh, so we, the, the particle accelerator we use is the SUNY Albany Dynamitron in Albany, New York. Um, like I said, we've used protons in our studies uh, from 250 keV to three and a half MeV. Uh, I was lucky enough to see the dynamitron open. Usually this is closed and filled with a high uh, dielectric constant gas. Um, the ions are generated here in the plastic part and then they're accelerated by the rings. Then they come down through this beam line and uh, they will hit the sample. And here you can see we've, we've modified our cryostat to, to connect to the beam line. And this is what I mean by the in situ method. So I can cool my sample to the operating condition of the satellite, irradiate it. And then because I also have the measurement equipment here, you'll see the MFIA and a laptop, uh, Keithley, I can do measurements uh, in situ yeah, immediately after radiation without exposing the, temp the sample to room temperature. So just to summarize the, the major point is uh, if you compare in situ versus ex situ results, uh, you can see that while there's no new peaks in the DLTS spectrum from doing in situ, um, even at room temperature, there was considerable annealing. So the peak is much, much smaller. Uh, and, and the dominant peak 
we call it P2. It's analogous to the, the E2 defect generated by electrons that I showed earlier. And if we take all the data on the in-house samples and we plot the trap density versus the damage dose, um, if we compare the in situ results to the ex situ results, you can see across the entire range of the damage, the in situ is always um, higher, more trap density. So if you were looking to replicate space conditions accurately um, and looking at worst case scenarios, you should do the in situ method. Now, we were also interested in, in the annealing uh, behavior at low temperature, because clearly it will anneal at 300 Kelvin and it will anneal probably below that. So we wanted to know how low the annealing will start. Um, so for this, we designed a whole new um, cryostat an experimental procedure. Um, this is a six, six sting or six stage cryostat. So I can load six samples in here. Uh, the samples go here on the sample stage. It's a commercial photodiode. And you can see a neighboring stage right there. And uh, here's the beam port. And it, acts, it has a carousel. So we can align the different stages to the beam port. And it also has an internal doer for liquid nitrogen that lasts about 10 hours. Now, the reason we did this is because we cannot, we wanted to do months of annealing testing at space conditions, and we couldn't do this at the beam line. I mean, they're not going to let us just sit there for a month. So with the internal reservoir of liquid nitrogen, I can expose it, shut the valve, keep the samples cold, put it in the car, uh, and take it back to our DLTS lab. Um, and here's the action shots with that. Uh, you can see our, our measurement equipment again. Here's the lakeshore temperature controller. So this is back at the lab uh, where I now I've connected to the, to the cryostat, a, a larger reservoir of liquid nitrogen. This is a 50 liter take tank and it would last about two or three days before I had to refill it. And uh, I used completely automated annealing scripts with the MFIA that did not take me too long to develop. And uh, those are actually also available to you. Uh, so I start the annealing at 150 Kelvin. I do 30 Kelvin steps. At each temperature point, I do 30 hours of annealing. Every 90 minutes, I stop the annealing and perform isothermal DLTS to measure, to measure the trap concentration. And then because I have six samples, I repeat this. Let me just say that this was the hardest experiment I've ever done in my life. And uh, if I ever ran out of liquid nitrogen, the samples would heat up and the whole experiment would be ruined. So uh, I wanted to go for more than one month, but the stress, I, I was only ever made to, to measure four samples to, the stress was just too much. I was waking up in the middle of the night. Um, in the future, I would do things differently. I would probably get security cameras to constantly monitor things and with my phone. But here's some preliminary data of the annealing. So I'm showing the, the remaining traps uh, concentration. This is the total annealing time, and these are the different temperatures. And there's a, a there's a logarithmic anneal rate. Um, and you can see each time I increase the temperature, the annealing kind of picks up and then dies down. And then you can see there's there's kind of three regimes here. There's it sort of stops annealing here until I activate it, annealing with a new temperature range, and then it stops annealing here kind of again. And then so we think that that P2 defect may be a, a collection of of different types of defects. Uh, the physical mechanism for this and the, and the physical defect itself, we're working with Sandia National Labs to sort of interpret this. Uh, but I, I hope to publish a paper on this in the coming year. So the conclusions are um, the in situ method, we're able to observe the response of the material without exposing it to room temperature. So we better replicate this satellite conditions. Um, we observe a dominant mid cap trap labeled P2. Uh, and in my paper, I will show that that P2 is responsible for the dark current. Uh, we observe low temperature annealing of P2 trap, even at 150 Kelvin, uh, which is, is very interesting and might have some, some considerations for uh, the satellite designers, uh, the people actually flying these 
detectors. And electron and proton ions create similar trap profiles. So now on to the, the tutorial section. And how am I doing on time? Okay, I think I'm pretty good. So I'll give you a quick background on, on how I was introduced to DLTS. Um, I'll explain some of the hardware involved and then a tutorial on the software itself. So I started DLTS measurements in 2013. I used the legacy SULA system. And now this system is not much different than how Lang used systems and when DLTS was first invented. Uh, the transients are measured and processed all in analog hardware and the finished spectra is sent to the PC. So the processing options are, you're limited to what's on the buttons and the knobs and the dials. Uh, and the, the, also the software that was included was, was sort of unreliable. There's no way I could have used this tool to do the annealing experiment that I just showed. That's why I, I looked into new options. I, I settled on the MFIA from um, suggestions from, some, from Ramon's group. Uh, and I coded my own software. Uh, the, the advantages here is that you can digitally capture the transient and you can process it on the PC. This means that your processing options are, are virtually unlimited. And you could do all these custom scripts with the, with the MFIA API, like I have done. And also uh, more benefits, the, the adjust, adjustable lock-in settings. For example, this allows you to do admin spectroscopy, which was talked about this morning. Um, one downside is you're limited to 10 volts in two, two point probe method uh, connection, but I haven't had a problem with that so far. That hasn't been an impediment to me. So comparing the, the SULA results that I used to get to the, the new system, um, a SULA, I, sometimes I would get very good signal to noise and sometimes I wouldn't. I don't know if our, our spectrometer was, was broken or I just was not very good at using it. I tried everything that I could think of, but you can see the, the new data is, is very smooth. And this is for irradiated um, gallium arsenide diodes. So the website for the code is here. And uh, there's initially a more mature MATLAB scripts version, and this will require a, a MATLAB license. Uh, but I am working on a Python version, which, which will be completely free. The software itself, uh, of course, is free. It's just the license that you'll have to get. Um, this is what the website looks like if you're not familiar with GitHub. Uh, to download the latest development version, uh, you would click on this code button and download the zip. Um, some things might be broken. So you might be better off going to the stable version that I've tested by going to the releases page, clicking on assets and downloading the source code zip. Now all of these, uh, most of this stuff that I'm gonna show you is, is in the readme file, but I'm gonna go over it with you live in person here. The hardware requirements is of course you need the device to test on. You need the cryostat with the electrical leads for device connection and the, the accompanying hardware there. You need a lakeshore, and right now I only support the 3.3 models, and I, I'm not, a, I only have a 3.3.1, so I'm not exactly sure which models I support, but I think it has to have GPIB. Um, so I guess you're also going to need a GPIB control, uh, adapter, uh, MFIA, of course, and a, a computer. And it should be a relatively fast computer, maybe like a Core i5 or better. Software dependencies, uh, clearly, as I said, you're gonna need MATLAB and, and to, for the optional toolboxes, you'll want statistics and instrument control. Um, here's some of the, the other software dependencies. I use some third-party libraries in my code. Um, for now, you don't need to worry about this easy fit. This is gonna be used in a future version, I think, to, use, to, to do the Arrhenius plotting. The big thing is you want to download the Lab One software, uh, which uh, you want the main server software, which you probably already have installed if you if you purchased the MFIA. Um, you can easily get these on the Zurich Instruments website, and you also want the, the MATLAB API or the MATLAB driver. Um, 
which will download as a zip file. And then I've also used these two uh, third parties. These are actually included with my code, so you don't need to download them. I'm only showing them here for attribution purposes. So the big things you need are, are the MATLAB and the, the Lab1 stuff. Uh, yeah, I think you also probably need the GPIB drivers, um, which I, I, I may revise this to, to show that. So here's a wiring diagram. Uh, Tim already showed, I think most of this, if not all of it, but on the MFI front, what you wanna do is connect the auxiliary out two to the trig trigger in one on the back. You may find if you connect the ground on the back to the cryostat, it will reduce the noise. Um, I use two point probe with the 10 volt limit. Uh, so you wanna connect these two to the sample. Uh, you want to connect the auxiliary out one to the auxiliary in one. I recommend using a, a gigabit ethernet connection to connect to the PC since it is faster, but you can use USB two and it probably won't make that much of a difference. Um, which of course means your PC needs to have a gigabit uh, port, gigabit ethernet port. And, I'll, and you also will need the GPIB adapter to, to contact the lakeshore. Uh, now these wiring diagrams are also on the site. I include the pictures just for, uh, for helping you get this set up. Okay, so the, to, to run the software, the first thing you're going to do is um, start the lab one. Uh, you'll double click on the shortcut here. It'll launch the web UI. You're gonna want to select these things and then open it. And then you can put that in the background. Next, you're gonna to wanna to take the code that you downloaded from my website uh, for the MATLAB code and unzip that to a folder. You'll see these files. I'm gonna explain what all these do. Uh, the acquire data folder contains the scripts that run the experiment, save transients um, into data files. Data files go in the data folder. Process data converts the transients into TLTS spectra. Simulate data will simulate transients files from the, the final DLTS parameters. But, you know, I haven't tested this in a while, so I'm not sure if it'll work. Uh, if uh, It shouldn't take too much to get back working if it's broken. Um, I've also included some, some background on DLTS theory um, that I've written and some more background stuff. Uh, the readme file, which you should definitely read. It's also on the main page of the website and the wiring guide, which we already went over. So acquire data, this is what you're going to start with. When you open that folder, you'll see this. Um, I should probably collect some of these functions into a, a subfolder for subroutines, but wherever you see main files is, is, is what you want to open as uh, main script files. The only thing you won't see actually is this lab one MATLAB. This is where you want to put the, um, the where you downloaded the lab, the lab one MATLAB driver from the Zurich Instrument website. You want to extract it to this folder and then rename it so that it looks like this, which is basically you just get rid of the version number. Um, then you're going to open CDLTS, conventional DLTS main file. And then it, I won't discuss these things here, but you can also do an min spectroscopy with this file. And then there's some, uh, some, some advanced scripts, like this is the anneal script that I use for my anneal experiments. So this is what MATLAB sh should look like when you open CDLTS main. It might look a little bit different, but the, the main points are you have this editor window that shows the code. You have the command window, which, show, which I'm using as an experiment progress log. And then the, then the run button, which runs the code. Now zooming in here on, on the code, this is where you're gonna set the, the parameters for the experiment. Now the, these sample parameters you're just going to go in and change the string here in between the quotes. Um, it's mostly arbitrary. This is used to describe the sample. You're going to give it like a sample name and the material. This is for later reference when you look back at the sample, the data files a year from now. Um, now, here we get into the actual things that, that control the experiment. The DLTS parameters, this is mostly the biasing conditions. Um, so here I'm looking at the, the applied bias to the sample and the steady SS bias is the steady state bias here. The pulse height is the pulse height. 
uh, full period is from, you could say, the beginning of one pulse to the beginning of the other. Trans the TRNS length, transient length, is what's actually measured and recorded for transient. And the pulse width is um, simply the pulse width. Finally, the sample time is how much time spent averaging. So like Tim was saying, we don't normally just record one transient. We'll sit at a single temperature and record many transients and average them. Um, and this, is, this defines how long you, you sit and average. So if you want to know how many transients are averaged, you can um, estimate it by just dividing this total time in seconds by the, the full period. So for temperature control, um, you're going to set the initial temperature and the final temperature of your scan. So that this is all automated through the lakeshore. Uh, you could do set the temperature step and the, the idle. So when the, when the scan is done, it will go to this temperature in case you don't want it to sit at 500 Kelvin for overnight if you left it unattended. Um, so the way I like to do it is I like to stabilize on each temperature step. I don't like to do some, the Sula had like a mode where you, you just take the data, you just constantly ramp the temperature and you take the data on the fly. Um, I prefer to be more precise and take and stabilize on a temperature point and then take data, stabilize, take data. But you can simulate the, the on the fly by messing with these stability parameters. Um, and I'll explain what those are. So this. So this is like the PID response. This is the actual temperature versus time. And then this is the set point. So this temp stability defines the, 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 um, the, the tolerance for when, when the, uh, the, the temperature is considered at the set point. And then along with the time stability, that defines when you are actually at the step, set point and stable. So we would record data from here. Um, and then also I could, I could figure the lakeshore parameters but there's very limited configuration, basically just the these control and measure sensor and also the heater power. Um, any other lakeshore settings, such as the PID parameters, you'll have to use the, the lakeshore front panel manually, which it works fine to do it that way. Um, these are some advanced MFI lock-in settings. Um, if you want to mess with these, uh, you're probably more advanced than this tutorial needs anyway, so I'm not going to talk about those, but the defaults will work fine for most people. Um, so starting the software, uh, you know, after you change the settings, you're going to hit run. Then you're going to observe the log and you see it will initialize the hardware and then it will pause. So you press any key to continue. I, I do this so that you can go back to the web UI, you can open the plotter. Make, just like Tim showed earlier, just show the, uh, the capacitance versus time data. And just make sure that it looks like it's you're running a DLTS experiment. And, and we are, right? We have the pulse here and the transients. So everything looks good. So let's go back to the software. We continue. We have the temperature stabilization steps here. Then you'll see the transient collection. And uh, you see the 30 seconds of sampling time. And then for, after it's collected for this temperature, uh, it will save a data file and it will output this plot, which uh, was inspired by some Zurich Instruments code. The yellow is the raw data for like one transient, and then the red is the averaged. So clearly averaging helps a lot. So where the data goes, it goes in the data folder, it's the sample name, and then appended with the date code. And then it, each, uh, each temperature point will have a tr the, trans uh, the capacitance versus time data for the transient. So to process the data, um, you're going to open that folder and you're going to open transient to CDLTS. Now, the only thing you have to change here is, um, and I'm, I'm almost done. So the only thing you have to change here is this folder name. You want this to be the folder name that was just generated for your data and then you can hit run. And that's all you really need to do. If you want more advanced features, you can change your rate constants. I, these are the six defaults that I use and I would recommend those, but you can pick whichever you like. And then also as Ram Ramon was, was talking about earlier, you, you can change the weighting functions. I've implemented six here 
I recommend using the exponential with interpolation. It gives the best signal. But like Ram Ramon was saying, it's a, it's a trade-off between the best signal to noise and the best selectivity. So if you want good resolution, maybe you want to use one of these other uh, functions. And this is what the, the, the program will spit out. Here you have the, the spectra, the spectrum, and then here you have the capacitance versus temperature. And this also is going to be put out in a, um, a data file in the data folder. So you can plot it however you like. Now, one thing I will say is I, I do not do automated Arrhenius plots. So you will have to find the, the peaks here and maybe make your own Excel script to do the Arrhenius plots. But that, that part should be pretty easy um, if you're familiar with the LTS. So I'd like to end on sort of a high note, uh, comparing the system that I built with uh, this commercial high-end BioRad DLTS system at Naval Research, they gave me the same sample that they used in this paper. And you could see this curve that I have plotted here is almost, it's exactly the same as you see in the paper. And I got very similar results. So I'm very happy with the, with the performance of this system. Also in the future is the Python version. It's going to behave very similarly. So if you know how to use one software, you can use the other. It works right now to acquire data, but processing the data into spectra is not, is not finished. Um, it will be easier to use, but harder to do custom scripts. So the MATLAB code will still be useful for many people. Also, uh, I have some CV code that I'm trying to implement into the main code. Um, here you can see I'm doing doping versus uh, depletion width. So I, these are the... Uh, Acknowledgements, uh, the team at RIT and SUNY, uh, collaborators on the NGAS research and funding, and then here's some acknowledgements for scientists that helped me build this system over the years. So I'm finished now and I open for questions. Hopefully I didn't take too long.